Which one's the best crypto asset? Well, Bitcoin's the best crypto asset. Okay. What's the second best? There is no second best. There's no second best crypto asset. There's a crypto asset. It's called Bitcoin, right? Right? There's no second best. Okay. Welcome to the Why Bitcoin Show with me, Dale Warburton. It's a weekly podcast on why Bitcoin matters and what makes it fundamentally different to every other crypto token in existence. I've seen firsthand how crypto really works. And my mission is to speak to the brightest minds on earth to help ordinary people distill crypto fact from fiction. Because as Lynn Olden says, and it's spot on, those that conflate Bitcoin and crypto simply don't understand either. Hello, hello, Mr. Jake Woodhouse. How are you, sir? Hey, Dale. Very good, mate. Pleasure to be here. Very excited to chat to you. I think we need to get this out front that the reason why I'm even having a podcast is because of the, the fellow I'm talking to today. So I want to thank you firstly for inspiring me, kicking me in the ass and saying, let's do this. And so you, if, if I do ultimately eclipse Peter McCormick, you can at least say you had a, a role to play in it. <laughs> I was the launch pad. Sorry, my, my alarm goes off just as we start the podcast. My apologies. No, it's oh, no, Dale, I'm, I'm absolutely pumped, mate. It's, uh, it, is, it is proof that um, the presentation I made at the Beechworth Bush Bash, you know, the whole goal was to inspire one person. And so if you're that one person, then my job is done. And yeah, we, we need as many people out there as we possibly can talking about Bitcoin, understanding what Bitcoin is and helping friends and family through what is you know, the biggest change to the monetary system man's ever known. So, yeah, it's very, very exciting. And I, I can't wait to see what you produce over the next six months or so. Awesome, man. I really appreciate the support. Um, so maybe, you know, for those uh, who aren't familiar with your work there, um, perhaps just give us a little whistle stop to, to who is Mr. Jake Woodhouse? Sure. So um, where to begin? Well, I, so I grew up in the UK. I'm now based in Australia. I, I really came to Bitcoin for quite a specific reason, to be honest, which is a long-term family wealth management. So my father was uh, 48 years old, had a heart attack. I was 20, my brother 18, my, uh, my, my sister 18, my brother 15. And, and dad, yeah, he died very suddenly and disappeared from our lives, which was fucking awful, to be honest. From that, we, we sold a family home and um, I inherited money in my 20s. So I'm now 34. I've spent the best part of the last decade trying to figure out, well, how do I keep what I was given? And how do I make sure that the next generation gets what is theirs? Uh, a bit more background on that being we, um, my father was running our family business, which is a, a brewery in the UK. So we've been making beer for a couple of centuries, which is quite an incredible story. Um, so we we have a uh, and a pub business as well. So uh, we have generated value over generations, and as a result, um, the the property that I was due to inherit was a very nice one. And so you know you're given this money, like well, what the hell do I do with it? Um, so I've been an investor in a number of different things on my own personal account, rather than necessarily a professionally trained investor, but actually investing my own capital in places that I see as a good place to go. And that's taken me through a number of different asset classes. We can jump into that story later down the line. But ultimately, I I really am, well, Michael Saylor, shout out to that guy. One day I'll get to speak to him. But in, in October of 2020, I watched a YouTube video that basically changed my life. And it was an interview with him and Raul Powell. And this guy was talking about um, how do I know that whoever's running my company 100 years from now has the best possible opportunity to do that? okay, I'm going to take my cash reserves and I'm going to buy Bitcoin as a treasury reserve asset. And I was like, holy shit. And the guy had gone and bought $400 million worth of Bitcoin, like off market, essentially. And you, you, you basically had a, an incredible, like a seismic shift in how a stock-listed company stores its own wealth. And a stock-listed company has armies of, armies of lawyers armies of rules and regulations that it has to abide by and they'd actually done it so that was a moment when i i took notice i owned a bit of bitcoin at the time but i now have you know a considerable amount more as my percentage of my portfolio than i did three years ago and um yeah that's a bit about myself basically so i'm, I'm a kind of self-taught investor it comes from a bittersweet scenario and um it all leads to bitcoin ultimately 
Wow, that's a that's an interesting story, man. Because it's not often that we have to sit and contemplate what's going to happen to our wealth in a hundred years from now. And when Salem and the likes of them are talking about, well, you know, w- w- if I want to preserve my wealth a hundred years into the future, what does it look like? I often thought to myself, "Who are you talking to, man?" In a way, you know. Mm. But it's really interesting to hear that that actually spoke to you on a personal level. Did you feel, by virtue of the fact that you sort of inherited this money that there was this sort of a bigger obligation um that you know you as a custodian of this of this wealth that you didn't necessarily earn did that sort of um i guess push you down towards the low time preference thinking or you know, thinking about the future um i'd never heard of the phrase time preference before coming across bitcoin so anyone out there that doesn't yet understand what that is get into it figure it out a uh, hundred years as a as an investment time frame was really that was the mindset I was trying to use, and an inheritance is it is funny there there is a certain amount of guilt with it right you you get this money and actually suddenly your life on a financial level is very different to the average person as a result and yes I have for large parts of my life felt guilty of it and run away from this money that I was given in some senses um, but it equally like when when you run a family business um that i'm luckily you know still a shareholder in and have seen what goes into it we're very very good at what we do and it takes blood sweat and tears so yes i've inherited money but at the end of the day i knew what work went into creating that wealth in the first place so um i think as i've matured i feel less guilty that i have this this capital and so really it is a case of stewardship like do not fuck it up that's kind of the <laughs> phrase that goes through my head absolutely um, rule number in, one in some ways it's, money. it's it's too it, it is slightly frustrating it's too it's too defensive a mindset it's like you must keep what you've got rather than like a really true abundance mindset where it's like okay i'm gonna go out and i'm gonna 10x this by creating something brand new and that that's the far more exciting way of looking at the world rather than like oh, i must must keep what i've been given um so it's really a it's kind of a blend of two, but yes, ultimately the hundred year time horizon, that is how I was trying to think about it. And the, the truth is none of the solutions I'd tried before came to me with that kind of, uh, that kind of horizon. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, look, if somebody, if I inherited some cash, I don't think I'd be looking for those sort of hundred X, 10 X, hundred X um, sort of you know, VC investments per se, maybe a little sliver here and there, but fundamentally I think, you thinking how do I sort of hold this or steward this capital into the future in a way that mm-hmm. is befitting for I guess my kids in the future too so yeah that makes sense and do you want to maybe touch a little bit on some of the uh, types of companies that you were invested in I mean did this were they sure. sort of any of them Bitcoin related or what sort of stuff um, were you involved in so so my initial strategy when I was let's say 25 was 50% into physical real estate and then 50% into the public markets. Um, The real estate I did on my own account in that I didn't have anyone do it for me necessarily. Uh, So, you know, I had this capital. It's like, you know, you need to find a property to buy. I was in and around London. So I ended up buying a house there or buying an apartment, I should say. I then took a, a kind of leverage strategy. So I actually took a mortgage and then bought a second place, took another mortgage and renovated one of them. Mm. Interestingly, the the 2014 prices that I paid for Ells Court, where my flat was in West London, I uh, I was were trading at 20% less in 2022 when I exited last year. So I actually wow. made a loss, an equity loss over eight years of, because I was leveraged, it was even worse than that. I ended up owning real estate in a building that had some cladding issues so if you remember that awful story yes. of a tower block in notting hill catching fire well i owned an ex council block flat which was my second property that had the same issue and they no longer can get mortgages for these places until the cladding gets redone so my my physical real estate tra- strategy after eight years i exited with a 50 percent loss which was an absolute howler and wow. I spent a long time worrying about what I should or shouldn't do. And the more I learned about Bitcoin, the more I realized that the opportunity cost of not taking that loss and taking that equity elsewhere was so big that I was only going to lose more 
then you know if you don't lose 50 percent today and you try and sell in a year's time and you've only lost 40 percent okay well you've got 10 percent back to what your original equity position was that's good mm -hmm. but what if you get a five bagger on the bitcoin like it's just it's not even close so my yeah my real estate strategy failed miserably uh, one of the things there that i found useful to think through or at least explain to people is real estate agents are more than happy to sell you stuff but they're not connected to the long-term sale price so they're, yeah. they're they're an agent they take a fee the same with the mortgage broker the same with the real estate um like interior design person like there's just an army of these kind of parasites that take money on the way through and are not connected to the ultimate realized price gain or lack of in the future uh, the other 50 percent i invested through a wealth management business uh, the first one was called rougher the second one was called tribe uh, these guys are a typical kind of 60 40 bonds equity play and they're um you know they're using their expertise to discretionarily uh, invest into different assets so you know once a year you'd get this portfolio through in the post and you'd have a basket of products and you'd have an you wouldn't have a fucking clue what half it was to be honest um so although it was a an interesting thing that um that process because i enjoyed like learning about financial markets and i enjoyed um trying to figure things out it was also immensely confusing and the truth is as well is again the, the financial advisor gets paid one percent per year regardless of performance and they know it's an incredibly sticky business model and guess what their buddies that you know your capital gets sent to the financial advisor the financial advisor is then sending it to their mate that runs a fund and they're taking fees as well and at the end of the year they're like oh by the way here you go we made four percent this year much very much in line with our medium risk that we were hoping to get um they've been paid their mates have all been paid yeah. you've made four percent but actually the hurdle rate's eight percent because cpi is flying and they're like oh no no one can beat cpi and you're like what are you talking about what are you fucking talking about so i've lost purchasing power because of that that was a recent situation i ended up in uh, tribe in particular was an impact investor so they were looking at esg and things like that to oh, yeah. screen uh, businesses that they didn't like the look of so oil and gas and things like this and that was a that was very much a lens on the world that i had pre-bitcoin which was i think that long-term resource management is insanely important and is being overlooked uh, the solution to that was you know um, esg essentially but i now have done a u-turn essentially and i think that until we solve fiat currency and central banking then it doesn't matter what tax what laws put in place the the planet and short termism and basically high time preference again touching on time preference comes into it then we're all we're all fucked basically um so yeah so just to recap so i did 50 percent into a financial advisor 50 percent into uh, physical real estate uh, over the years, I slightly changed that in that I did some angel investing as well. So I was looking for clean tech startups. Um, you know, I probably put 2% of that into uh, into, some, into some startup companies. I've made one exit so far with the 3X within three years. Some of those companies are looking to, you know, potentially 10X my money, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, along the way, I've obviously also bought some cryptocurrencies. Um, I got scammed in an ICO, sent some blokes some money, some pounds to a guy in Scotland who said he was going to make me some, uh, what was it called? The blockchain development company was going to reinvigorate the the way we finance solar projects using a blockchain. And I was all into this and I sent him 2000 quid and never saw it again. Uh, I bought, you know, anything that anyone told me was like a good bet. I was kind of buying bits and bobs here and there. Um, but yeah, so I bought my first Bitcoin in 2015 and still hold some of that today uh but it wasn't really until 2020 that like bitcoin caught my attention in a serious way because of that michael salem mo uh, move and basically i don't i don't own any physical real estate any longer i don't have any money with any financial advisors any longer i have some company shares the family business i own bitcoin uh, in a self custody and i have cash and that's it well wow. What a journey, man. And I think what's really rare there is the honesty with which you speak. If, if you were an American, I say this with respect, but they're very good at self-marketing. And I've met a lot in my travels. And you could very easily have portrayed yourself as being this sort of whiz kid who has you know, <laughs> accrued an enormous amount of wealth. But your your candor and just honesty in describing, I think, is, is refreshing. Um, and it's something you. I can relate to because I mean, honestly, it's, it's investing's fucking hard. That's the oh, truth. Yes, so I was I was richer 
five years ago than I am now. And a large part of that's also because um, I tried to start my own businesses and work for myself and avoid working under a salary for another business. And so I've, in a sense, been investing in myself. Um, I've also got married and had kids and all that kind of stuff. So your expenses start racking up. But um, yes, no, there's there's the, the the net asset balance doesn't lie. And in particular, going back to that real estate loss that I had to realize, I had a paper gain for seven years. And when I went to actually sell them, I made a 50% loss. Yeah, so the market just that. wasn't there. So you can you can live in La La Land all day long with a semi liquid asset like a real estate, and think that you're you know, well your quid's in you know, and then when you come to sell, there's no buyers, and the interest rates have gone up, and the world's going into turmoil, and this is the only bid you got in six months, mate. So you better take it. Whoa. And that that's that's one of the reasons why Bitcoin is so beautiful, because it's the most liquid asset that you can possibly find. And you can store it where you want. So you can sell it when you want, you can buy it when you want, and no one can ever take it off you. And that's just an extraordinary improvement in any of the other store of value assets that I'd tried before. Not to mention it's uh, the asymmetric bit of a lifetime, but we'll, we'll get onto that. True to that as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. So the upside's insane. One of the things I think about from time to time is on the philosophical side, because there's a saying, obviously, in Bitcoin that you sort of, you come for the gains and you stay for the revolution. And I think yeah. the, the interesting, That's me, 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, me too, frankly, I mean, look, once you see number go up, technology is incredibly powerful. And I think it attracts a whole new wave each cycle. I guess the, the question I have then is sort of what is a Bitcoiner to you when you think of one? Um, well, I can talk very specifically about my own experience with this, which is, and you know, I've for those that don't know that are listening, I run a podcast called Bitcoin with Jake. I'm about seventy five episodes in now. And Probably should have mentioned that from the outset. Eh? Yeah, I shouldn't should I? Rather than like <laughs> the kind you, of self, self-taught investor, but oh, whatever. Man. No, yeah, you can put been. it in the show notes. Don't worry. <laughs> um, the the story that everyone tells on their route to Bitcoin is different. Like everyone's journey is different. Everyone has a different lens that they view this thing with. Um, Saying that, there's a, there's a lot of similarities. And um, I'm now at the point where I genuinely believe that anyone that has the same view of Bitcoin as a Bitcoiner is first and foremost incredibly lucky. Like They're just in the most insane moment in time where this is actually happening and they've actually figured it out. And 10 years from now, it will look obvious, but it's not. It's not obvious at all. And the reason it's not obvious is because it it requires this eclectic mix of skills for people to understand. And not everyone knows everything when they first come across Bitcoin. They'll have one particular angle that's, you know, solving a problem for. Like, so in my case, it was a store of value thing. It's like, hang on, so yeah. you can actually legitimately use this thing to store serious amounts of money with and you're not a fucking moron. <laughs> wow, that's that's massive. Let's have a look. Let's get yeah. closer. And the closer you get, the more you learn. And you're like, oh my gosh. So Austrian economics. What the hell's Austrian economics? This wasn't taught to me at school. Hang on a second. I realize in hindsight, I've been taught to make money, but never taught to ask what is money. Yeah. And so you go down this incredible journey of, you know, the history of money, um, and then this whole economic philosophy of human action and trying to to look at the world through an individual and their choices rather than these ridiculous kind of metrics and, and models that were thrown down our throats at university and going through business school that they never really made much sense, but yeah, sure. Okay. You can fiddle with the, the interest rate and that's going to actually impact the inflation because disposable income is going to change. And there's this whole kind of like Keynesian philosophy that supposedly, you know, steers the world to a more prosperous place. But the reality is the world around us is falling to pieces. You know, institutional faith is at an all-time low. People are more unhappy than ever. There's more suicide than ever. There's more depression than ever. There's more hunger than ever. It's extraordinary what's happening around us. And suddenly Bitcoin becomes this kind of haven of hope. And, and sound money is this thing that just makes so much sense once you start to figure it out. So a Bitcoiner is basically someone that's incredibly fortunate to have figured out that there is this technology that we can use that will bring a more abundant, fairer, happier, safer future. But in order to be in that position, 
you have to have been doing a certain set of things in your lifetime that enable you to see it for what it is. And so yeah. just to summarize in my sense, so I saw it for a store of value, but also I had a startup at one point that was looking at the energy grid and how we might give flexibility to the energy providers uh, because of the adoption of renewables. Renewables aren't always, it's not always windy, it's not always sunny. And so the baseload power that coal and gas used to generate that's been removed from the grid isn't there any longer. And it means they're having huge problems balancing the grid. We were trying to get people to switch their lights off at a certain time and use like an app to get homeowners to change their behavior. It's like a behavioral economics type type idea. So I learned about demand side response. And when I started realizing that Bitcoin mining could be used as demand side response, and there's this whole kind of energy play, I was like, whoa, that's massive. But then yeah. also I've been looking at long-term investing and, and wealth management. And there's a number of other, you know, kind of startup related stuff that I came across as well. It just so happens that I'd also own some, like what are the chances of me not buying it? You know, pretty high. So yeah, yeah it's a Bitcoin is a very, very fortunate person that actually sees a much happier future, um, but has had to do a lot of work to figure out what Bitcoin actually is. And more than likely, the more they know, the more they buy. And their net wealth now represents, you know, probably 50% plus is Bitcoin. Yeah, I've heard that figure thrown about that a Bitcoin typically has 50% plus of their net wealth tied up in the asset. So that makes sense. Um, and you you sort of touched on so many different points there um, and that it means something different to different people and you need and, and it's sort of people come from it from different angles and it's so multi-layered in the sense that i only i only sort of late 21 really started going down the, the energy side of things and was just yeah. blown away at things like demand response as you're describing the ability to take flared natural gas chuck it through a generator don't ask me how and mine bitcoin mm. and actually use some of this waste productively to then be able to expand renewables elsewhere. I mean, these are the kinds of things that required effort. And I think there's two themes that I've sort of sort of picked up with Bitcoiners. One is an ability to think critically. You need to be open-minded. You need to be willing to think, you know, think things through from first principles. Um, mm. So I think to me, that is when I think of all Bitcoiners, we are, we are very different in many different ways, different ages, different backgrounds. You can just think of all the different tick the box, whatever it might be, category. But um, this ability to to really think differently and to question things is, to me, the foundation. The next thing is actually work. We are prepared to put an effort towards something that's interesting and we'll go to great lengths to learn what is true because, unfortunately, and fortunately, Bitcoin is not simple. Mm. You know, once you've got it, it's it's very very intuitive and mm. i always like to refer to a, a quote from parker lewis which just says like it's impossible to see initially but once you've seen it it's impossible to unsee and i mm. want to try and help people see it and then have difficulty unseeing it because um initially for somebody just getting to the space uh, there is a commitment towards upskilling that is necessarily required if you are to develop the conviction to buy any sizable amount that's going to change your life. Like anyone can buy 10 bucks or 100 bucks worth. That's easy. But if you want to, if you really want to try and see what this, if you want to make a proper allocation relative to net wealth, you need to put in the time to develop the conviction so that you can withstand the volatility because volatility is part of the game. Mm. Yeah. So we touched earlier on the fact that you were a podcaster and I didn't mention it from the outset. So, uh, yeah. Um, but That's right, mate. you've obviously now you've had 70 some episodes and mm. you've spoken to all sorts of folks. Actually, I think you said once to me that you've chatted to pretty much person in every continent in the world, something like that. Maybe not. Probably. No, probably. probably. Yeah. yeah. And so what I'm wondering is, have you picked up any, sort of trends amongst the guests have you seen any themes amongst the in the discussions as to like uh, are there any distinctions within the different geographical regions as to what sort of bitcoin means to them are you seeing a common thread throughout or are you seeing people coming from different angles depending on where they are literally physically in the world mm. um well there's there's kind of two answers. So one is well, both both questions have a like correct answer, if that makes sense. So 
the the similarity that I find so astounding is that this neutral money with no CEO, you know, just a white paper that was released, this code was thrown out there, it has kind of organically bootstrapped itself to where it is today, has a decentralized network of people that have honed in on it and have decided to adopt it as their primary form of money. Now, whether that money has been used as a store of value, as a medium of exchange or a unit of account is neither here nor there. The point is, is these people are all completely and utterly enamored with it and are using it. And that's incredible. So that's a huge similarity between everyone. And you think about my experience just here in Australia, the the events I've been to, you know, I've four hours outside Melbourne, you and I met for the first time in this tiny little town called Beechworth. And it's kind of laughable in a way. Like what in the hell am I doing in the middle of country Australia, like going to a cryptocurrency event? Like this is crazy. What the hell's going on? But here are all these other people doing it. And I had such an awesome time. And so I've spoken with people, you know, Central America, Africa, Asia, Europe, you know, the US, and all these people are using it as their primary form of money. What the fuck? This is incredible. It's like a it's like a huge social movement and no one's really talking about it because it's slightly in the shadows and the mainstream media won't recognize it. And central banking is incentivized not to allow it to exist because it's going to completely eradicate them from the world. And there's lots of reasons why that's the case. But the, so the similarity I notice is this kind of decentralized wave of, of people. Um, the difference is, is Bitcoin solves problems for different people in different ways. So um, to give some examples, uh, I interviewed a, an amazing lady called Farida Bemba, who was originally from Togo. Um, Togo has struggled over the years with something called the CFA, yeah. which is a, a, a an ex-colonial kind of financial imperialism, if you want to call it another thing. So 14 African countries have a, a fiat currency that's controlled from Paris. The, the gold of the country is actually stored in Paris. And, you know, Senegal is another country that's under a similar experience. And they, they debase the currency when they feel like it. And they like buying raw materials on the cheap from Africa using their own currency that they then debase when it's got too expensive because they've racked up too much debt back in Europe. Unreal. And this is this is criminal, right? And they keep in place these kind of these dictators that, you know, there's no freedom of speech. There's no real proper form of law. And um, it's... It's all smoke and daggers. It's it's evil shit, basically. So Farida is is really eloquent about the history of Togo, her family, and the use of, of Bitcoin as a political justice tool. Um, that is very different to me coming at it from like a store of value use in a Western country where actually inflation, yes, recently has been particularly bad, right? Oh, 10% CPI. I think it was, you know, 25% personally. But the point is it wasn't like 50% overnight and that happens every decade or whatever's been mm -hmm. going on with the CFA. Um, another inflation uh, kind of problem-solving person was um, El Sultan Bitcoin. Shout out to him. He was originally from Caracas in Venezuela. Absolutely crazy story as to how the Bolivar has just been disintegrated in value and what that means for the average person that's trying to grow up and run a business in Venezuela. It's it's nuts. Um, and then, you know, it's closer to home, like Aussies. It's, it's, it's different people all over the place with slightly different problems that is so incredibly unique about it, right? Um, finally, I think I'll just add, like, there's a, uh, an interview I did with Lord Fosutua, who's from Tonga. He told a story about a uh, you know a couple of Pacific Islanders. One of them's in Sydney. He's made a hundred bucks. He wants to send it home to his cousin in Tonga. Well, he uses Western Union. That's the only way to really do it, and it costs him thirty percent in remittance brokerage fees via Western Union. The mm. cousin then has to spend ten bucks coming from the village into town to get the cash. And there's then gangs that sit outside the Western Union office inside the town that take another ten bucks. So of the hundred bucks only 50% of the money that was supposed to be sent home makes it back. Now, Tonga is a place that 50% of its GDP is remittance and their GDP is a half a billion dollars. So they could literally add 25% in GDP to their entire country if they adopted Bitcoin and Lightning Network tomorrow. That's so the, 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 the different problems that are solved by this new tool depend on where you're from and they're all very unique. 
Um, yeah, just so just lastly, I really see from all of these conversations that I've had, like number one, my conviction has got stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Yeah. All these people have done countless hours of research, have actually used it and continue to, to, to advocate for it every day. That's an interesting signal, especially as like an investor allocating. It's like, okay, all these people have done all this work. I think that's a good bet. And we could all be wrong, of course. We could be completely and utterly wrong, but I'll be wrong with them. Um, and lastly, just this, this idea of product market fit. Bitcoin's product market fit is in places, at least initially, where the financial systems are most broken. And we don't necessarily have those initial problems, so I can get credit cards and debit cards and different bank accounts and all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, Tonga and that example there, remittance is a huge, huge, huge business for a bunch of money cartels that currently make a lot of money doing it. And they're, they're, they're mincemeat compared to what Bitcoin's going to do to them. So, yeah, it's it's a, been a fascinating journey, Dale. And I can't wait to talk to you after you've done your 50 or 100 or so episodes because you're just it's an honor to learn from these people. It's really incredible. Well, those are some really interesting stories. And I guess if I were to try and sort of distinguish between two main themes there the one is kind of people that are investing it as a store of value that they've they've got a long-term time horizon they're not traders these are people that just want to preserve purchasing power into the future we usually say you know anything less than four years is silly you mean you, you, mm -hmm. if you're going to be buying and holding it as a store of value you should be looking at four years plus obviously due to the volatility um if we look at the developing world they're looking at it more from a payment solution perspective due to all the intermediaries in between sucking the value from the transactions. And often those are those small value transactions are where the fees are highest as a percentage. So I, I guess the next question I'd ask is, it's easy to talk to folks in the developed world and say to them like, look, if you want to invest in this, here's what you need to know. You put aside what you're prepared to lose. I don't think you're going to lose it, but that's, that's in your mind. You need to right size in your portfolio so that you can sleep at night because this thing's volatile as hell. It's going to go up, it's going to go down, it's going to go sideways. We don't know what's going to happen. But if you don't have a time horizon in excess of four years, this is probably not the investment for you. Maybe you need to do some more work. I always wonder how the hell we sell this to the developing world where the practicalities of it from a technology and a transfer of value perspective are really there but they just don't have the ability to withstand volatility. I think of things like Galloy, um, Galloy's stable sats, where it's sort of artificially pegged to a US dollar where you can transfer value seamlessly through the lightning network from one country to the next, for fractions of a penny, and you still have that dollar value. So I'm wondering in your conversations, how have those in developing, developing nations sort of dealt with the volatility? Mm. That's a good question. Um, well, shout out to Okin. I had him on last week. I haven't actually released the episode yet, but he's in Namibia. And his answer to this was awesome. He's like, if you earn Bitcoin and you spend Bitcoin, there's no volatility. And I'm like, fair, cool, right? And so he's yeah. talking about using, he uses apps on his phone for playing games where he's getting sats back for his attention or using fountain and a value for value type idea where you're getting paid for your time. And there's also like a, a sub stack equivalent, uh, which pays you in sats for reading articles. Um, of course, over the long term. So if you were to get paid in sats today and then not want to spend them for six months, then you might, you know, see a 20% or 50% drawdown. I'm not sure. Um, but first and foremost, if you're, if you're just thinking and living in Bitcoin, then, it really doesn't make much difference in terms of volatility because you're just earning Bitcoin and you're spending Bitcoin. And as long as your sats balance is going up over time, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, the other examples that are useful, because obviously I'm not necessarily in developing nation to, to say what problem it's solving for me, but um, you know, another example would be Master Guantai, who I spoke to. He's based in Nairobi in Kenya. So the Kenyan shillings, it's pegged to the US dollar. So they have no control whatsoever on how many US dollars gets printed. And that automatically ends up as their own inflation rate in Kenya. And for him, for example, he just says, everyone knows that the money system is broken and that it's been rigged against them. So as soon as you show them uh, a viable alternative, they don't care. They don't need to be taught a second time. There's actually no selling really involved. It's like, mm. oh, hang on. So I can keep it. It's mine. No one controls it. Yeah. Brilliant. Done. 
and there's there's very little sales process um so with with the the kind of the scaling of the lightning network which allows for micro payments for the first time ever then that's not so much a problem um equally the volatility thing just for me as a store of value kind of lens one of the things bitcoin's taught me is actually i don't care about volatility very much now i i think of it as like if you've got money that you don't need for three to 30 years bitcoin's a brilliant home and actually when you're managing a portfolio of wealth, when you buy a property, for example, real estate, you're not buying it to flip within three years. You're buying it to hold it for three to 30 years. So the, the time horizon is basically exactly the same, but you've got a factor of difference, like a 10x multiple potential with Bitcoin, and you might get a you know, 10, 20% year on year gain in the real estate space. Not to mention so, the liquidity. You yeah and then you've got liquidity on, issues exactly it's yeah. i mean real estate is just an absolutely terrible store of value in comparison to bitcoin and that's why i decided to sell at a 50 percent loss to get my money out because i knew that if i didn't do that i would kick myself for the next decade as bitcoin just absolutely obliterates it and basically we've been forced to use houses as a form of money because our money system is so bad that's how much money they printed basically um, so yeah, so just in terms of that, the developing nation question that you answered, uh, that you asked, um, first off, if you earn and spend Bitcoin, then it doesn't matter because you're, you know, just in the Bitcoin circular economy. And second of all, their, their financial systems are so bad, they don't need to be sold a second time. It's like, sure, yeah, done, let's go. Mm -hmm. I guess the difficulty is avoiding the, 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 the shit coins. Yes, that's, that's the hard part. And there's just so many of them, unfortunately. I mean, there's even, even that um, hip hop fella or the econ. He's got his own crypto. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's kind of, you kind of think like, if your government's money is not good, what makes you think that a celebrity controlling <laughs> the uh, money is yeah, a good yeah. idea? It just doesn't add up. Um, but yeah, it is because there are so many scams when I've tried to at least orange pull uh, my ex-domestic worker who's from Malawi, phenomenal chap. And I just do a little, I've got a little DCA here in Australia for him. And I said to him, like, look, man, in 10 years, I'll, I'll, I'll send this through to you. I'm not going to send it to you now because you'll probably lose it. But um, to him, he still doesn't get it. You know, he's, he's heard it's a scam. And it's because there's just a plethora of shit coins out there that have little to no value at all. And um, it just sort of muddies the water for a lot of these folks who don't necessarily have the the time or the resources or the ability to be able to distinguish kind of what's real and and what's not um and i suppose yeah that's a very good and that's a very neat segue to the next little um part that i'd like to discuss which is kind of my bug bear obviously those who who know me here in, uh, in the bitcoin community in australia know that i worked in crypto media for a period of time and developed a very healthy disdain for it for all things shitcoinery uh, fuckery squared uh, you could call it mm -hmm. and um you know i think <laughs> when i think about when i think about you know people getting confused i even had a conversation as recently as two days ago from my fiat boss who said i, I kind of get bitcoin in a way but um it's all of these other things and like, you know, the, 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 the NFTs. And I mean, I just can't work all these things out. And so the average person kind of hears all of this lumps it all together and kind of just says, it's just puts it in the too hard bucket. I'll stick to what I know, particularly here in Australia. That's real estate. Obviously mm -hmm. everyone here loves real estate, even though it comes increasingly out of reach from the average person. So um, I suppose when you, are comparing bitcoin versus crypto mm -hmm. what kind of my mental model do you have i'll describe mine and you can tell me if you think it is more or less in alignment i've i kind of go digital gold is bitcoin um it's a commodity and then you've got basically companies and ponzi schemes and scams on the other mm -hmm. essentially at best um pete dunworth had, has said it before as well that it's sort of it's like bitcoin's uh, the TCP IP, the sort of protocol of the internet, and then crypto best is like these applications built on top. I quite like that, but maybe given sort of your, your background and business and whatnot, like how do you look at this stuff? Because you dabbled in shitcoinery from, from what you said. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's part of everyone's journey. So um, just at a very high level, 
when you have capital, capital is a kind of stored energy for any other want of phrase. And there is saving and there is investing, right? And they're actually two very different things. And the thing that you want to save in, generally speaking, is money. And money is the most saleable good in the marketplace. And there's a ton of good, like the Bitcoin standard does this very well as a simple entry point to kind of run through what is the double coincidence of wants. But when you're looking at an old village and someone's got a cow and the other person's got a sheep and actually they don't really want the whole cow, but they want to get rid of the whole sheep, what do they do? Well, they're stuck. They're in a, they're in a barter economy. So money actually developed over time to solve that kind of intermediary problem. We've used shells, we've used gold, we've now had you know paper money atop gold, and now Bitcoin is the best form of money man has ever had to utilize. Now money does three things: it's a unit of account, it's a um, a store of value, and a um, medium of exchange. Medium of exchange. Thank you. Yeah. And and so. When, when your capital is like, okay, what am I going to do with my capital? I need to invest some, but I want to do that in order to return more capital to grow it over time. And I look at Bitcoin actually as a savings technology. So it is, it is money, basically. Uh, it just happens to be money that's monetizing as digital money right now and is hoovering up financial value all over the place. So it's acting in some ways as a, a good investment. But the risk profile of Bitcoin versus other investments is actually a lot, lot lower than what it might appear once you start digging into what it actually is and the ability to self-custody, this lack of counterparty risk. It's just the most insane thing. But there is a point at which you can try and outbeat, outpace Bitcoin. And the question is, how do you do that? Because you know you might want to say, okay, I've got my you know, capital, here's my 100% allocation. Um, where do I think it's going to, you know, be safest over time, I want to keep some for liquidity and some for cash and some for investing. So I, I very much follow this kind of Bitcoin maximalist philosophy of like, there are scammers all over the place that use the good name of Bitcoin to to lure people into their ecosystem by saying, oh, my coin's a bit better than Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I, I hate that. It's literally you're utilizing the purest, most true insanely kind of selfless innovation that has happened to us in our lifetimes and will be the case for centuries to come. And you're stealing that goodwill and you're, you're, you're luring people into your den and that's, that's bullshit. But at the end of the day, you know, Bitcoin also teaches you about libertarian ethics and that's a fascinating world in itself that we haven't touched on yet. I don't care what you own. You can buy whatever you want, fill your boots, mate. I'm more than happy to explain to you what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, but that doesn't actually mean it's the right option for you. So when I look at shit coins, it's like they're just another asset class, but they are not Bitcoin. They're something very different. And that can be you know, highlighted in a number of ways. Like, first of all, there's no founding team that exists somewhere in, in, in the world at this point that runs Bitcoin. So all these, other, all these other cryptocurrencies, they have a CEO, they have a CTO, they are corruptible in some ways. They always are changed. You have to just look at Ethereum as the main kind of competitor in the crypto space to Bitcoin, and it's changing all the time. You don't know how many Ethereum there are today. There was a pre-mine. There's a whole load of things that are like, okay, this isn't, this isn't the same thing as Bitcoin. So there's a very, very clear distinction in my mind as to, okay, as a capital allocator, what, in, what is a saving, what is an investment, and what kind of level of risk am I willing to take? Now, is there a space for trading uh, shit coins? Maybe. Will Ethereum outpace Bitcoin for a period of time in the next bull market? Maybe. Can I time entering Ethereum and exiting Ethereum and scooping up more Bitcoin? Maybe. But I could also do that with a derivative of an index in the US. I'm going to buy the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ is going to outpace Bitcoin for a period of time. And I know how to trade it in and out of that asset. So I'm going to scoop up more Bitcoin as a result. That might be possible. So it's it's a funny one. At the end of the day, the the crypto space is full of kind of innovation. They're more like startups in my mind. Like you're buying a a, a startup equity that's going to be diluted over time. It's highly risky. You don't have a clue where it's going to go. All you really know is that the pitch deck of this company that's at seed stage is not what's going to happen, if that makes any sense.
Now, that's not that I'm against early stage venture capital. I'm absolutely not. Quite the opposite, in fact. I think it's an absolutely awesome area of business. Um, but yeah, so that's just some of the ways I think about the difference between Bitcoin and crypto and then you know other asset classes. Makes perfect sense. And that sort of aligns with my philosophy. It's almost like, look, there's... I have no interest in kind of what you invest in on a personal level. Um, I, you know, I, and I don't judge you for it. If you want to, if you want to gamble, if you want to invest in, if you want to invest in companies or real estate or bonds or gold or, you know, or shoot coins, I don't care. Um, I guess what's inspired me to have conversations like this is really just to help ordinary people just navigate the world of the crypto space. And just to understand some of the perspectives from Bitcoiners who believe that fundamentally Bitcoin is money and that these other cryptocurrencies just can't be money. I've even gone so far as to think, I'm not sure I even want to call them cryptocurrencies because a currency implies something that it's associated with a nation state. Mm. I'd be more inclined to call them sort of equity tokens. You've got mm. like a share in whatever this so-called solution is i also call it solutionism because it's not obvious to me that there's any problem that they're solving um but is there perhaps some sort of like yeah upside in trading absolutely um we know that they're more volatile we know that they because they are less liquid the moves the swings are very very sharp you have you know if you've, if you've got some sort of little shit coin number 10,088 um, if you're an insider and you know what's going on, you can actually move the market really quickly. So, yeah, I, I suppose part of my part, part of my objective here is to sort of help people understand what a pre-mine is. That's just giving yourself and your friends some equity tokens, saying, come into my company. I'll give myself some free and I'll give my friends some at a discount. To, mm -hmm. If you don't like that principle, you might not like the other cryptocurrencies. They all work that way pretty much other than the proof of work ones. A sailor has said um, he, he actually thinks the whole 60% dominance thing is actually really just stupid. He says like, oh, it's not 60% dominance. It's like 95, like 96%, because what you're really comparing it against is proof of work cryptocurrencies where, the, where you literally have to expend real world resources, energy to obtain these tokens, as opposed to these others, which much like FTX, which is printed off the net. So mm -hmm. I think your framework is sound and, at the same time, it's just like, yeah, do what you want with your own money. Just be aware of the fundamental risks and the differences. One is about saving, planning for the future one's money. And the other one is to my, you know, from my perspective, largely speculation. Yeah. Um, you know, I suppose when I think about the future there, Jake, and I think, well, what is, you know, when you think about what Bitcoin is going to look like in a decade, it's really hard. The world's moving very fast. It's changing. We live in a very volatile period i mean i've been very heavily influenced by books like the fourth turning and the sovereign individual which suggests that there's more civil unrest and inequality and all sorts of things largely driven by broken money um, that are going to be characterizing this particular uh, decade if not the next two and i've always thought that there's going to be something there's going to be something that just makes people just stand up and say wow like I want to, I need to get a slice of this, whatever it is. Have you got any sort of, have you thought maybe of what that could be? What could be the tipping point? I mean, is it CBDCs um, or is, is it just, is it another a mass confiscations of people's assets? You know, like a Canadian trucker example where they go like, no, we don't like you guys protesting over here. Wrong views. We're going to take your money. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's it going to take or what do you think could happen? um gosh i mean th this is speculating i i don't know what the future has in store all i can all i can say is is that the the problem i face is a 20 something you know here's some money look after it the there's a certain element of stress right you're very very young you don't know what you're doing. You're going to these meetings with old financial advisors and they're running fucking rings around you and you know you're getting duped and there's not much you can do about it because this is what you've been recommended by your dad's old accountant, right? There's, there's not much kind of sovereignty in your decision-making. You're just trying not to cock it up and take as conservative approach as possible. And, and the Bitcoin rabbit hole has just been this incredible process of taking responsibility for what's yours and 
and taking action and doing it in this incredibly defensive manner. So what we haven't really touched on is, is what is ownership? And so you can own a house, you can own an equity, you can own a cryptocurrency, but do you really own it? And the answer is until Bitcoin self custody came along, that was the best form of ownership was a, a judicial process via a human run court in which you're hoping that the local government holds up to their word that this piece of paper says you own the rights to this little bit of square meterage. But in a Bitcoin denominated world where self custody exists, if it went really extreme, you know, you could walk around with a seed phrase in your head, right? Now, that's unusual and not necessarily likely to be needed. But the point is, is the, the whole process of ownership has been flipped on its head. And so now that I've managed to move a significant percentage of my net wealth into Bitcoin, I have this insane feeling of, of tranquility versus before. Where like, I know that what is mine is mine. Yes, there's going to be some volatility. A fuckload of people think I'm completely mental. But I'm <laughs> You're not so alone. comfortable with the decision. I'm so comfortable with the decision. And so in many ways, even if there is Armageddon in the next five to 10 years, I don't care because I've got Bitcoin in self-custody and no one can take that off me. Um, you know, and, and, oh, they can kill Bitcoin. They can regulate it or they can shut the internet down. They can't. They can't. Just start doing some research. Anyone that tells you that has spent less than 10 hours researching this subject and therefore doesn't have a fucking clue what they're talking about and has no grounding to be any threat to the way that you think and so shouldn't be shouldn't be even considered as part of the conversation so yeah. that that's just the first point to really hammer home which is this, this sense of peace and calm Now, don't get me wrong it was stressful selling things at a loss in particular mm. and then you've got to get it in the bank account then you've got to get it to a bitcoin exchange and then you've got to get it into self-custody and don't fucking send it to the wrong place because then you'll never see it again and all these different hurdles you've got to get through or that exactly. the exchange is on bank holiday and hasn't sent it, but it says it's left your account. So I'm like, where the fuck's is Bitcoin gone? <laughs> I had a number of really hairy moments that a bunch of people aren't going to, aren't going to go to this effort. They're just, they're just not capable of taking this kind of ownership, but um, it's done now. And I go to my unchained capital multi-sig vault and I have a look and I'm like, come on, you know, <laughs> that, that is going nowhere. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, I mean, you know, think, I think just to just to chime on what might happen, I mean, I, I've read The Sovereign Individual. I've read The Fourth Turning. These are great books that are part of the Bitcoin habit hole. You know, things like um, The Creature from Jekyll Island. You know, read these fucking books. If you haven't read these books and you're listening to this podcast, you're very close to being, you know, a Bitcoiner first and foremost, but you're not until you've read those three books. And they open your eyes to this thing. It's like, what the hell is going on in the world? So, yeah, I think we're guaranteed to see more inflation. That's like an absolute given. And as more inflation happens, people get poorer in purchasing power. If people get poorer, they get upset. And when they get upset, there's a revolution. And when there's a revolution, there's a war and people die. So, you know, we'd be retarded to sit here and think that we're going to get through this without some kind of bloodshed. I hope it's not in my you know personal vicinity, but who knows? Um, the, the the odds are stacked against us, to be honest, in terms of freedom and, and, and liberty. This threat of a central bank neutral currency is very, very real. And the digital gulag has been built. You know, COVID was a, a, a disease masquerading as some kind of like world ending issue. But actually what they've done is they've put in the plumbing for the digital medical state internationally. You cannot get on a plane unless you've had this jab. Okay, what's the jab? Oh, well, we think it's safe, but we haven't done much testing on it. But if you take it, there's no liability on us. Sorry but you still can't travel without taking it. That makes no logical sense, right? Who in their right mind goes through that process? Oh, everything's fine. It's not fine. Mm -hmm. It's medical fascism. Oh dear, big, big problem. But Bitcoin exists. And that gives me huge faith that those of us on the ground that are not interested in living that way of life can actually do something about it. And I've seen things happening that counteract that process. So here in Australia, lockdown was fucking miserable. But there's all sorts of interesting things that have been, you know, come up in, in retaliation to that, such as I had some guys from the Australian Beef Initiative on my podcast. Um, shout out to Nathan and Izzy and John. And they're basically connecting together rural producers of regeneratively grazed beef to urban buyers and people can buy using Bitcoin. 
So gone is the the large intermediaries and the and the big butchers in between. And now you have a direct food link in your countryside. And so people are building an alternative network. They're just doing it. They're not waiting around to see if they're going to be okay. They got they got scared. They got shaken up. Like myself, I was in this 200 square meter plot in central Melbourne. I wasn't allowed to leave or do anything. Like, what the hell has happened to my life? Didn't know where my food was coming from, where my water was coming from. If I left the house without a mask on, I was stared at like some kind of zombie. It was just an extraordinary time. And I swore to myself, I will never be this vulnerable again. And I think that that has that's woken a lot of people up. Um, so we'll see. I, I obviously have I have hope because of Bitcoin, but um, you know it's 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 nature playing out, right? You watch a David Attenborough movie, and I love those those documentaries. What happens when a wounded lion is you know in the last phase of its life? Well, it lashes out and it kills as much shit as it can kill on its way down. That's what's going to happen with this globalist movement. And so, yeah, it's going to be a rocky ride. Absolutely. And I think that's speaking to the fact that we came for the gains and we're staying for the revolution because for those who've put in the time to understand Bitcoin for what it is, to me, it, it represents optionality because mm-hmm. nobody can take it away from you. Nobody can debase it. Mm-hmm. And as they describe in, uh, in the sovereign individual, previously your assets were really just located within the within the country like real estate let's say and it's basically like a claim you've got a claim against the sovereign to who may or may not choose to enforce mm. that right over time if your if your property's digital just pack up and you mm. you can fly he speaks about how you know how we've been treated as the nation state has grown and grown and grown and grown it's never gotten smaller we're treated more as cattle uh, than anything else mm-hmm. that can be ex- where our wealth can be extracted from and now these cattle can just get wings and fly we can just go wherever we want wherever we treat it best and i actually can foresee countries around the world competing for bitcoiners in the next 10 to 15 years perhaps even sooner depending mm-hmm. how quickly things accelerate i tend to be quite pessimistic i share some of your views in the sense of i feel like this decade is going to be really challenging i think it's going to be inflationary it's going to be division inequality civil unrest we're already seeing populist governments who are who have taken over whether it's in italy most recently more populist leaning government in finland took over from the 31 year old nightclub dancing queen so things are things are changes afoot but the wheels, the macroeconomic, the geopolitical sort of transitions are not necessarily instantaneous. These things take time. And what I am confident in is the fact that Bitcoin is going to play a really, really important role in the future. I suspect that as the US continues to illustrate that A, it will confiscate assets from those nations who are unfriendly towards it or who it deems are a problem, aka Russia, as it continues to debase its currency, we're seeing more and more of these countries now saying, we don't want US dollars. We don't want treasuries. That's not, that's not, the, that's not the pristine, pristine sort of reserve collateral that I'm actually looking for. There are going to be smaller nations, as well as potentially some of the other nations that are emerging from the sort of multipolar world. They're going to say, let's stick some of this on our balance sheet. Or countries are going to say, do you know what? We actually, we don't want any of this IMF debt. Um, we don't want anything more from the World Bank. We actually want to, we want to be sort of cash flow positive. I mean, if most of these Western nations run like companies, they'd be fundamentally bankrupt. That's mm-hmm. the most obscene thing. And I think that's the one thing I've learned going down this rabbit hole is how, how absolutely bizarre fiat is in the sense of this money doesn't exist. Like when, and even even just what's happened most recently with a number of these banks going under, you kind of realize how incredibly fragile things are. And the only thing that supports it from prevents it from breaking is more debt. Mm. It's a debt based system that relies on more debt for growth. And in the process, what do you do if you're printing more and more money, asset holders get wealthier, the cancel on effect. And who's, who's sort of sacrificed the altar? It's the little saver, the diligent schmuck who puts away 15, 20% of his paycheck thinking he's a genius. No, mm. sorry, boy, <laughs> you're losing money. Mm. Uh, your money's melting. 
And so we all have to become speculators. So, you know, you said something earlier about your house becoming like a tool for speculation. I think you were saying something along those lines where that's one of the reasons why property is so unaffordable here in Australia, it's simply because it became a logical vehicle for people to speculate on. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a critical sector for Australians, uh, like in terms of the economy, provides a lot of employment. 80% of Australians' wealth is tied up in their primary residence. So do you think this thing is going to tank? Nah. It's not politically expedient to do so. So with Bitcoin, you've got like, I mean, besides being the most scarcest digital asset, the scarcest asset on earth that's ever existed, unconfiscatable, cannot be debased. Uh, something that you can actually physically own and take with you that nobody can confiscate. Um, oh, and by the way, it's probably going to outperform every single thing on earth. I think... Uh, it's I'm more bullish today than I've ever been because I think now is Bitcoin's time to shine. And I feel better today at whatever it is, 30K than I did at 69K. And that's the amazing thing. I don't care that much about the price, but I'm like, these fundamentals are looking so good. And this is Bitcoin's time to shine. This is what it's made for. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's filled me with hope too. Cause much like you, my, my what story. A time started- to be alive, Dale. It's what an amazing time to be, time to be alive. I mean, I, I'm so grateful in many ways, and this is why we've become evangelical about it all, because <laughs> it's enriched my life so much. I've met the most phenomenal people. These are just people who are curious, critical thinkers. We don't all think the same, but there's something about getting in a room full of Bitcoiners that just leaves me feeling like so optimistic and excited and grateful. So um, I don't think there's ever been a better time. Uh, for Bitcoin and um, that tranquility that you spoke of is just running through my veins, man. Mm, that's beautiful. <laughs> Isn't it? Hey, um, I guess just before we sort of end off um, something that I thought uh, I wanted to, to touch on you with is, you know, when, when somebody's starting in this space and they, you know, again, going back to the sort of Bitcoin and 20,000, 30,000, 30,000 other cryptocurrencies, a very regular question when we get asked is like, where do you start? Like, like literally, where do you start? I'm blessed that I, I was studying for a financial planning diploma, jumped to macroeconomics, discovered Linolden and friends, and boom, Bitcoin, right? I didn't go down the shitcoin rabbit hole. Yes, I traded in them, so we've all done a bit of shitcoinery. It didn't work. <laughs> so, but um, people, get, people get very distracted with a lot of things, and they think to themselves, look, there's so much out there. How do I know kind of what's real, what's not? Like, where would you direct people? What's a great resource or who are the best resources in your mind from a beginner's perspective? Well, well, first of all, if you've ever asked, if you've never asked the question, what is money? Then you need to do that. And if you have an ounce of intellectual curiosity, that question will lead you down the most extraordinary rabbit hole that you could possibly imagine. And to answer the questions that crop up during that process, you're going to have to do a lot of work. And there's just a ton of different places. Um, Just to pump my own bags for a second, I have a website called bitcoinwithjake.com. And I've got 70 odd episodes where I I specifically talk to people about their personal journeys. And I look at it kind of like an angel investor. What is Bitcoin? Well, it's very early. It's got great potential, but it's really about the people. And so I want to know who are the people that have adopted this thing? What did they know that allowed them to see value in it? And how are they helping to build it going forwards? And what I've found is it's just the most awesome due diligence tool because they are either, you know, someone like myself from the UK that has been to university or they're someone that is, you know, a political activist in Togo or they are in Guatemala building Bitcoin Lake, shout out to Rishi. Like it's just nuts, right? All these people are are literally committing their lives to helping ensure Bitcoin's health. So that's a very useful due diligence tool, but it takes a lot more time to go through, you know, hour long episodes. Um, I've also got a section where I've curated all the content that I've read, watched and listened, uh, which is kind of helpful, but that's actually now so big that it's hard to say as a complete beginner, you know, go and check out my website because it's not that clear. I need to figure out a better way of producing entry-level content but just to circle back ask the question what is money and a couple of high-level books vj boyapati the yeah. british case for bitcoin is awesome 
Uh, Safe for Dina Moose is the Bitcoin standard is awesome. Um, and that's probably about it for now. That's enough. That'll keep someone going. Definitely. Definitely. The Even just the article, um, Vijay Boyapati's, um, yeah, what is money? That is a phenomenal place to start. And that's actually what I've seen many people. Um, and once you've got that ticking, it's sort of, you naturally, as you say, you kind of fall down the rabbit hole because you go like, wow, how did we end up? How did we end up from, <laughs> you know, shells to gold to paper? <laughs> yeah. Tell me more. Yeah, exactly. Well, awesome, Jake. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much for once again for just kicking my ass, man, and getting me on this journey because nah, it's brilliant. I, well done, Dan. I'm going on the journey with you, and it's it's really exciting. And um, yeah, I hope to I hope to have you on. And maybe you could be my hundredth guest again. How about that? Well, maybe we'll chat <laughs> sooner, but. I, I really like, I really appreciate Hit the century it. and I'll come back. <laughs> there we go. There we go. But um, yeah, did you want to sort of get a hand off to anyone listening um, uh, to any of the work you do, Jake? Uh, just, um, yeah, check out the podcast, Bitcoin with Jake. Um, I'm on Twitter, Jake E.S. Woodhouse. Um, trying to shift over to Nostra because I'm told that's the thing we need to do. And I've played around with it a bit, but it's not necessarily the best place to figure out what I'm doing. So yeah, Twitter and check out the podcast is the best. Brilliant. Ditto on Nostra, man. I'm uh, working my way through there, but <laughs> it ain't too intuitive for me yet. No, um, well, it's just so early, right? They just, yeah, no one's yeah. built decent tools on it yet. So yeah, but it is interesting. I mean, as, as content creators, one of the things I've noticed that is a huge risk is platform risk. Yes. So you have to like pump your content out over lots of different platforms because the cancel culture is real and they would just turn you off. So something like Nostra, which is just a protocol, an open source protocol that's potentially the future of social media, absolutely incredible because you can get in super early, start building your community. And if one of the, the hosts cancels you, you can just open another host and your same public private key relationship allows you to access all the followers and followers followers and posts you've previously done so it's a, it's a very interesting innovation that one needs to keep an eye on but um yeah well dale listen i'm I'm so pleased to see you here and to be honest it didn't feel like your second ever episode so oh well, you're, you're a champ hey thanks so much appreciate it, hey. it. My all right take care cheers there. all right so how'd you go with that i hope you enjoyed it I hope it made sense and that you got some value. If you have any feedback, good, bad or ugly, or any questions, I'd really like to hear from you. Uh, get in touch via Twitter, at Dale21M for 21 million. And if you found the episode useful or valuable in any way, please consider subscribing, giving it a five-star review, or otherwise just sharing it with a friend. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, I'm not here to tell you what to invest in. I'm simply here to make sure that if you're going to invest in crypto outside of Bitcoin, that you do so with your eyes wide open. Much love, friends. Appreciate you all. And I'll see you again soon. Cheers.